Welcome, 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 dear everybody, to Stammer Stream. You may notice that our regular host, Wesley L. Jenner, is not hosting this podcast this time. He is doing something, I don't know, something related to cartoons, probably not important. And that is why you have me as your gratuitous host. That's right, I'm taking over this podcast. And then conquering it. We're here against our will, help us! I'm not, I'm just here for the lols. <laughs> That's the I'm just... I'm just here for the attention. <laughs> yeah, that's how you start. I mean, I did try taking over the world, but turns out that's really hard. It takes so much time. So I figured I'd work my way up there. You know, start with some <laughs> podcast nobody listens to, take that over. I then... start with a negative Z grade <laughs> manga podcast. <laughs> and then the world... <laughs> Hey, I didn't say it was step two that. to go to the world. Next, I'll try some podcast that might actually have a few listeners. And then maybe <laughs> something bigger. And from there, I think I'll already work my way up to taking over some fast food joint in this town. Once I take over the impractical jokers and rooster teeth, then Denny's. <laughs> I don't think there is a single Denny's in Finland, so... Well, yeah, you gotta expand. Hey... You gotta stay domestic first. Besides, at least here I know the quality is good. That is true. Denny's is... American. Hot garbage? Is that yeah. maybe a better term for it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, without further introductions, because, I mean, Wednesday's probably gonna add the, you know, names in the video, so... Let's just move to manga. Everyone can just read that. Yeah, that thing we talk about. Yeah, who gives a crap who's here? Let's do this! Yeah, and <laughs> having this time randomized the list, first up, Dr. Stone. Which is actually, funnily enough, the first one in the Shonen Jump reader as well, so this is really yep. convenient for me. <laughs> yep, because this week, I even got the cover page with him either making poison... All the Philosopher's Stone, but I think it's poison, which is a bit more morbid than I was expecting. Yeah, a poison that somehow glows green. Maybe he's making radioactive poison. It, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what he's made. Because it also seems to be... It looks like he's bottled lightning, which is thematic. But then there's a skull and crossbones on the bottle, and I don't think this is Chopper's flashback skull and crossbones. I think this is actual poison skull and crossbones. Well, I mean... <laughs> Drinking lightning probably would be pretty unhealthy, so let's give him that. <laughs> yeah. So this is chapter yeah. 25, By These Hands, The Light of Science. Now yep. that you read the title, would you like to recap the whole chapter? Love to. Uh, so basically, uh, what's-his-face's spear is destroyed, and he's pretty sad about that. Uh, but then it's revealed that what they have made is incredibly powerful magnets. Uh, they decide that he's going to create an electricity machine uh, with a really enjoyable iShield 21 reference along the way. So, because he's going to use manpower. Uh, so they make a dual hand-cranked dynamo, and they convince the two, the two people to work with, with it. Uh, more specific, yeah, more specifically, Gen does, uh, by claiming that they can make more gold and silver spears. After which, Sen Senku manages to create light while giving credit to the wrong person who didn't actually create it. <laughs> and then they're like, yay, I love... And then there's a nice moment at the end. And this would all be very, very good if not for the fact that they're crediting the wrong person for who created everything. <laughs> How so? I, I, might, I might have missed that bit. Uh, so he's crediting Edis Edison the entire time, when yep. the more the more apt choice would probably be Nikola Tesla. In term in terms of who actually created what he's what he's using. Ah, uh, true. However, however, Edison's more the Ed Edison's known as, known more colloquially as the creator of the light bulb. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The, not the not science up to its usual standard, but splitting. I think 
in any of the series, it would be splitting hairs. So, so somewhat. I, it's just a misconception in general that annoys me because, like, as you find out, what Edison was the best at wasn't so much creating anything, but patenting. Things. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> he just patented a load of shit, and a couple of them were useful. Yeah. Um, but overall, I I really love this chapter. Doctor Stone does very well in making its accomplishments feel like actual accomplishments. Dedicating dedicating a whole full page spread to the actual creation of electricity, uh, taking the time to see how it affects all of the characters, uh, particularly Senku and Chrome, and even though it may not be historically actor accurate. Uh, placing Senku's revelations next to flashbacks about him idolizing these people as a child set right against to the actual people first creating electricity, which didn't happen. But (laughs) if it did, this would all be really excellent. And even so, it is really cool. And the art in this chapter is just lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the old style art he uses for Edison himself and especially that one two-page spread when he finally creates the light. Oh, Showing I love everything that. Everything in black. That's gorgeous. The darkest night, except this one source of light. The shadows forming on Senku and Chrome. Mm-hmm. And this chapter made me realize a strength of, particularly Inagaki, but a strength of Dr. Stone in general, which is that it has done a phenomenal job building a cast in a very short period of time. It, the, it's only been 25 chapters, and most of the characters here were not even in those 25 chapters. All of these people are very new. Chrome, Kohaku, Gen, uh, Kinro, and Ginro. But having them interact like this in this very... Su- Suika as well. Uh, I don't credit them as much just because they don't really do a ton this chapter, but them as well just... We're getting such a good amount of interactions between them, and it all feels natural, it all feels enjoyable, and I really have to credit the manga in creating such a coherent cast, which is something that certain other series we we recap haven't been able to get done in hundreds of chapters. Mm. But they've done so well and so quickly. It is impre- it is impre- yeah go on sorry yeah and what i really appreciate is how much it makes me appreciate every single thing senku manages to create and as it stays in one panel naked and alone i was born into this primitive earth now one year and four months later i finally arrived at the root of science at electricity so in that short time from literally nothing he was able to create electricity, which we use for so much nowadays, in that stone world. Makes you show just how smart he is, and just how much he has to work for such simple things. Well, simple for mm. us, but... Mm. Can I also point out an amazing joke, like, during Senku's flashback, is, like, he's reading his book, it's like, alright, gravitational, electromagnetic, that's electricity, there's a strong force and a weak force, stuff like that. Meanwhile, the teacher's at front just pointing at the blackboard, which just goes, 5 plus 3 equals 8. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah Senku was pretty ahead. What I like is... Just... Yeah. yeah. I also I'm just like laughing, go ahead. one visual gag, just when they're like figuring, we would need two people who are in perfect sync to rotate these discs. And just the faces everyone has when they look at Kinro and Ginro, especially like, Kohaku's hmm. kitty face. <laughs> It is it is very funny to say I have a I'm not entirely sure if this is meant to be like suspension of disbelief for hey here's here's a here's a good plot but a number of there's a couple of decisions Senku's making that make me think he's less good of a scientist and more has essentially mem- memorized wikipedia because honestly they're next to a river if he'd built this machine underneath the waterfall it could be going permanently with no manpower i think what we've seen a lot in dr stone is uh the accomplishment and then the execution i think we probably will get that or even wind power as was 
kind of foreshadowed in the co cover page where Chrome has a wind turbine. But I think what he's just kind of going for right now is, all right, I've done it. I've created mm -hmm. electricity. I've proved it can exist. Now I focus on actually, you know, working with it. Not to Which mention, I, yeah. I don't claim to be an engineer, but I assume it's still a lot harder to create a machine that could convert that power in the exact right way. And it might be a little hard to also use materials that could withstand the force of a waterfall. Yeah, you also have to deal with erosion, which would be like erosion and buffering and stuff like that. It could be he just doesn't have the materials yet. Uh, true, but you can do it. Um, essentially, you could do it with like medieval equipment of a wooden water wheel and a pulley system. Well, it, it, yeah. Now, I'm mm. also I'm also wondering if it's an interesting thing I've noticed about Senku is that any time he achieves something, he always acts as if like, yes, I'm perfect. But yes, I'm perfect. I'm done. There's nothing else to do. This is what this is what I had in mind, and it's amazing. And everyone go, around him goes, "Wow," because they've not really seen anything else. But it's normally got a couple of flaws in it, and they, it's it's normally the second or third version of the experiment that actually goes through. But he never, he, it's, one of the aspects I like about Senku is that, though no one's called him out on it yet, he's not perfect, but he acts like he is. And it's an interesting point of, I want to see it come, I, I want to come, I want to see his hubris come bite him in the arse at some point, of him thinking he's perfect, mm -hmm. but he's not. And I'm wondering if it's going to come up, because I'd really like to see that. It's that very Haruma quality of him that I really enjoy, which is almost the psychological aspects of wanting to inspire the people around him, of sort of acting like he has everything under control, but often getting very quick reminders of, eh, not so much. Like, you re you really do need them. Yeah, and like, remember when he first came into the stone world? He could do exactly. Jack on his own. Mm. It took him Exactly, and... It's it's something about and I've I reread I Shield Twenty One pretty often, but it's not really since um, Doctor Stone has really started hitting its stride that I haven't really recognized just how much I've missed Inagaki's character writing, and it's some it's something that more and more I'm remi reminded of that what he does so well is he takes these very you know, simple character concepts, but dives really deep into those simple aspects of them. And <clears throat> I, it's, it's hard to say whether or not it's the best we're seeing right now, but I, I will say that I think in Dr. Stone, we are seeing the best utilized cast out of any series in Jump right now. I would agree. I, I very, very nearly agree. But there's one thing in the back of my mind, and I'm not sure if it was like the training wheels coming off or a series starting and having to cast off bits and pieces. Do you remember Taiju and his girlfriend? Of yeah. course I remember them. Taiju I love them. Yeah. They've, yeah. We've, I really would have expected them to have come back into the story by now. Well, I wouldn't it's have, actually. only been 15 chapters since they left. Exactly. But, I... The world's evolved significantly to the point where um, Sukasa has enough of enough of a power base to start sending out members. Yes, but I worry that if you're doing, if you move it too fast, if you're like, oh, here's, you know, Taiju and Yuzuriha back after a couple chapters, you know, here's Senku's army after ten chapters, I worry it would become what we're constantly complaining about in Black Clover, which is that things are happening uh, too quickly before they're really managing to set in. And it is starting to set in now, which I like, but I'm actually, and this is a credit to the manga in general, I have enough faith in it to allow them the time to really build up the tension and to build up something that we don't often see in manga, which is a feeling of the lack of a character's presence. 
uh, and intentionally so. Like, we feel the lack of character presence in Black Clover, where we're like, hey, wow, Gaucho and the others haven't really shown up in a really, really long time. I wonder yeah. if they're okay. <laughs> Actually, I but checked, it... and it's only been ten chapters since the two Senku and Yuzuri, no, Taiju and Yuzuri ha left. They left mm -hmm. the series in chapter 15, we're at chapter 25. Then it might be just, not the not the fast, less the rate the story's been going, but every chapter's had so much packed into it that maybe I'm thinking that it's it's longer. If it's any, yeah, if it's 10 chapters, then I'm I'm probably getting a bit paranoid. But that, because all the other series I like go bad, and I don't want this one to go bad. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So far, it's showing no signs of going bad. Even when it shifted um, yeah. its focus and had the village, it still retained the same quality. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this greatly right now, and I'm just kind of... And I'm, yeah. I'm just looking forward to seeing where it goes. And a few chapters ago, they acknowledged that Taiju and Yuzuriha are still out there. Mm -hmm. they, they haven't been forgotten, which I like. And once in a while, even Senku will reference Taiju in his mind, which I, 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 like, where it's, I like where it's going in general. So, mm -hmm. now that we're done filleting this series, shall we move mm -hmm. on to something... Okay, I can't make this joke without getting some charges in some country. We'll have never learn. <laughs> okay. So... I've been go... I, there's... A lot of shit happens in this chapter, and I don't think I, I've been able to process it all yet. And I think it looks interesting, but I haven't. It. Do you want to do you want to talk about it, Nova? Because you can tear into it, and then I can figure try and figure out what's how I feel about it while you do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to tear into this necessarily. Um, so essentially, what happens is Ogata um, starts to have these dreams, these very romantic dreams involving Uega and starts to research the concepts of kissing, I guess. Um, the girls finish their finals, which seems crazy. I'm not... I, un I understand that, you know, they're already in the summer term of Japanese school right now, but for the concept of We Never Learn, they seem to be going at a pretty breakneck pace in terms of the school year. Yeah. Um, Ogata seems a bit out of it, uh, she then shows up having bought two tickets um, for Ogata and him to go to a movie. Um, there's actually a very adorable thing for, like, Uega, of all people, to be like, oh, I haven't seen a movie in so long because I'm so poor. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, that, like, out of everything in this chapter, that was definitely the moment where it was like, aw, aw, oh, wow. Uh, there's a kissing scene. Um, and you, and Ogata kind of looks at it very confused and almost, yet, um, analy analyzing it, and sort of talking about how she feels like maybe a normal girl, like the girl in front of her, would probably be uh, in tears. We know this; it's her friend from the science club who's in tears, which, <laughs> hoping that you know she can bring Ogata with with her next time. They then go out, uh, buy more soda, I guess, and sit down. Um, Ogata says that she, she did, she picked it because it was the, you know, the one that the internet said had the best kissing scene of any movie playing now, which I don't. That, that's an odd Buzzfeed article to find, I guess. <laughs> um, so they keep talking about the, those concepts. Uh, it's referenced, you know. For some reason, Ogata's like, oh, you're you're having my soda. That's an indirect kiss. And I'm like, I don't get why this is such a big thing in Japanese media. It's a Japan it's not, thing, yeah. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Ogata uh, continues to go through some confusing emotions before possibly kissing Uega and then running off into the distance. I say possibly because I'm not sure which direction We Never Learn is going to take this in. I, I feel like there's a kind of, like, classic harem like, well, it looks like change would happen, but burp it up, burp not really. But I don't know. This is, an, this is a very odd chapter. It definitely does depend on where we go from here. 
Um, I really like this chapter. It's weird. Like, we never learn... Okay, I... Comes to the table. I enjoy dumb harem comedies. They are fun to laugh at and and and, and, and normally quite funny. But I, the bits I like about We Never Learn is it... That's its base level. And it will occasionally go into some interesting stuff about teenage about teenage about teenagers trying to find their place in the world and this is a really interesting chapter about um about ogata the thumbelina princess i think that was her name Mm -hmm. um who we know is the science girl trying to understand the arts and literature and doesn't quite relate to Hector, romance. Ellawood, I didn't know you two were here. Essentially, mm-hmm. takes a, var- a very scientific uh, method of I how thought... do I understand kissing? Never mind. It makes me feel weird my things mistake. in my. It w- makes me feel weird things Hector. inside of me. I don't know how to. I don't know how to deal with them. I know I will. I, I will collect research and ex- and experiment. And it's really interesting to see because she is studying. She's studying storytelling, so she goes to see a story, but it doesn't work because she's not good at literature, despite wanting to do it. And we end with, I think it's, I do think it's implied, because the final two pages are in complete silence, of her catching um, Uega off guard and kissing him, and then running away. And it's not portrayed as... Dumb, as, do-do-do, this guy, the guy got a kiss, it's it's portrayed as it's sort of she definitely stole a kiss from him and it's sort of just left in a very quiet almost not quite somber but tensiony note yes but the build up to it is a little odd and i think maybe it's just the english translation or maybe it's just the weird way male harem leads are often written but the stuff Uega says that's supposed to seem, like, very comforting and stuff like that seems bizarre. And, like, at one point he's like, now, now, Ogata, the way you said that, it sounded like you just wanted to see some good kissing. And I'm like, that's a weird thing to say. That's not, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's quite as comforting as you think it might be. Well, it's not. And if you see from the reaction, the effect is not what he intended at all. I think it's... Uega occasionally does that thing where he tries to say he try he tries to say wh- what he thinks he's meant to say and fuck shit up because from the next reaction is her going what the fuck do you mean oh and then she takes the wrong step I don't do you... know it's there's moments of very quality writing and we never learn and there's moments of rather unfortunate awkwardness yeah and i don't think intentional awkwardness either i just think like there's there's sometimes an idea the mangaka is trying to put forward but because of the tone or because of the words used it doesn't always come across Mm. this is one of the few chapters that has both and both in very very quick succession yeah i feel like they're There are certain uh, times, particularly in the conversation on the bench, where something's said, and I'm like, that's really awkward, and that's really weird. Like, I feel like people wouldn't talk like this. And there are other moments where I think, okay, this this awkwardness here actually makes some sense, uh, given these two characters. And then it goes right back to the other stuff and right back to the other stuff over and over again. And it leaves the chapter with a very bizarre feeling at the end. And I will give it credit that it did establish a tone that works for the ending that's trying mm. to create. That That's something I can't really argue against. It certainly did. But it's a bizarre chapter. Yeah. It's very out of place. Like, there's honestly not much comedy in this. It's very, mm. it's very, it's very dramatic without anything actually happening it happening in it leading to that those last two pages of just pure silence and movement i i, I do agree that mo- the occasionally i get annoyed at we never learn because occasionally you can hear the voice of the middle-aged author coming through the vo- coming through uega 
And it's at that point where it, it's normally in unfortunate circumstances. Where I'm just like, teenagers don't act like that. That's an unfortunate way to treat women, et cetera, et cetera. And possibly, like, he's... Which is weird because he's normally really, really good at getting inside teenage minds. So it made it... I'm not going to hold a... Yeah. This is a weird chapter, and it's, of course, going to depend where it goes from here. But you mentioned at the start, they've just sat their finals. If this is, like, the start of the wrap-up we never learn, like, it's not going to it's not going to outsay its welcome, then this will be a really interesting direction to go. But it, again, all depends where we go from from here. But I do like this chapter. So I'm not entirely sure I can I can quite put it into words because it's, like you say, it's very weird. <laughs> yeah. So, no. Can we move on to a manga that I can actually talk about soon? Sure. No, more about we never learn. <laughs> yeah, go on. Let's talk about the Roroni Kenshin reboot. Let's go. <laughs> no, we're talking One Piece, and I'm recapping it. Cool. All right. So, One Piece, chapter 877. I'm not that sweet. So, cover page, we once again get Luffy's crew from around the world. Well, his pirate alliance or whatever. And this time, Sai has returned home to his fiance, Uholicia. And things about to get awkward since he, he, he fought... returns. Yeah, he returns to his fiance, the crimson chin. <laughs> you seen the size of that thing? That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure it's the right kind of impressive for a fiance, but yeah, gonna get awkward when he brought baby five back. Yeah. But mm -hmm. enough of that. The actual chapter itself now. So, we start with Brook and Chopper being in quite the trouble since Sparrow Sparrow is now covering Chopper in candy. Basically doing what Mr. F what's Mr. 5? No, Mr. 3 did back in Little Garden. Yeah. With wax. And my brother is stuck. Browser is stuck for some reason. Okay, now it's... Oh dear. <laughs> but yeah, he starts going like, everything will cover you. You will take your breath away, you will writhe in agony, and in three minutes, it will kill you. He starts a timer! The timer is not addressed in the rest of this chapter, it's kind of terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he even says there, I'm no candy man myself, you must have thought me sweeter than I am. Title drop. <laughs> and this island isn't that sweet either. But yeah, he actually places a clock on top of Chopper's candified form, just as an insult to injury. That's I... kind of metal. Just placing someone's timer of how much they got left to live on top of them. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Perro Sparrow was kind of awesome in this chapter. <laughs> he was great. Like, he, he was kind of like, I, I kind of like, Took him as like, oh, he's the older son, but he's he's the older son, but he's not the powerhouse. Oh, okay, interesting power, slightly creepy persona. Ah, oh, good enough character. And then this one is just like, nope, I'm fucking terrifying. There is a reason I look like the candy, um, the child snatcher from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Mm -hmm. But then problems start arriving in the form of their mom, and I'm not sure she's gonna be satisfied with just putting them to bed with no dessert. <laughs> Yeah, but they start thinking like, okay, we'll just send her to putting on Cacao Island, because otherwise when she realizes that I lied to her, I'm gonna die. But Dogtooth notices that Straw Hats are also there. It was there, you guys, that got taken out by the giant lightning bolt. So they start sending all the mooks back, because there's no point keeping them around since Luffy has the Conqueror's hockey. They just get knocked out. But then Peril Sparrow shows again how awesome he is by creating Candy Maiden! Basically a spiked wall of candy. It was so dark! It was like, here's an Iron Maiden, made out of candy, children! I'm gonna love seeing that in animation. 
<laughs> Except it's done by Toei, so maybe not. Animation might be a strong word. Well, I'm gonna I'm love seeing it. In... Book. <laughs> I'm gonna love seeing it in the series of gifts play <laughs> duct taped together. <laughs> but yeah, Jinbei thinks, okay, go around it. No, Luffy says, no, straight through it. And uses his red hawk, which apparently, yeah, it really does have fire on it. It just melts the candy away. Sending awesome. bits with flying back at his crew. But have then he clashes about with. This? What? Sorry. Hmm? I was going to say, have we talked about this? The way that all Luffy's moves since the time skip have been his old opponents and friends? Have they all? Apart from the ones named after animals he learned from the island. He's got Red Hawk, which was Ace's move. He's got, um, he used El Thor on the giant in the Colosseum, which which was actually NL's move. Um, he used Kuma's, he used a move named after Kuma. And a lot of them have been named after old opponents and friends of his. I, eh, I, I don't know. I, I, really... I, I think the Kuma thing might be stretching it a little bit. Yeah, I only see that really with Ace's technique. Mm-hmm. There's been a number of other ones, but I, I get your point. It could just be, it could just be. I could be reading into it um, through, like, taking the hint from Ace and expanding it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, then he goes against Katakuri or Dogtooth, whichever, who uses also a stretchy punch to match his. Probably just turning his arm into mochi, and since that stuff is pretty stretchy, or maybe he builds an arm on top of his arm with mochi to match Luffy. It and... is awesome. <laughs> Yeah. It's great. We see, uh, he's, it, it is the upgraded version of the of the gum gum fruit, and Luffy's got to fight it, and that's a really cool setup. Just yeah. in general, but... Dogtooth has been a delight this entire arc, and yeah. it does not change here. Even he's in great. the silly army of Big Mom, he remains that badass that really should not fit, but damn it, he would fit with everything. He fits perfectly. He's also fucking broken. He's a Logia that can predict the future and is Luffy's fruit, but better. And yeah, with hockey hats... and... Well, yeah. everyone has hockey in New World who's worth anything, so... But, yeah. he's actually, but he actually is decent with it. Uh, I When we sort of saw that Dogtooth had the highest bounty revealed so far in this series, I was wondering, you know, what they were going to do to expand with it. And it's not like, oh, he shoots, like, giant blasts of energy. It's not as though he's, like, a swordsman who cuts through an entire mountain with a single slash. He's just a stone-cold badass who, throughout yep. this entire arc, we have not seen get, like, one-upped even once because he's just good at what he does. And now Straw Hats are between Very Hard Place and Oh God, We're Fucking Dead. Mm. Because Big well, Mom is behind them, Karakuri is in front of them. Parasparrow's fucking shit up all around. <laughs> they have their fleet arriving. Yeah, mm -hmm. and at this point, Pedro starts talking to Carrot. Oh no! Thinking, yeah, thinking that these would be the people who the Kozuki clan have been searching for for several hundred years. The ones that will lead world onto a new dawn. Not really sure what this is like. Is it just like these guys could do something we've been trying for ages, or if there's some prophecy shit here? I think prophecy shit. At least that's the impression I got. Like, hit, yeah, um, the impression here, I yeah. get, but that's what I hope it is not, because fuck Same. prophecy stories. We'll find out in Wano anyway, because we're definitely burying the lead. Well, Cause... anyway, Nami starts prepping shit up because they figure we gotta get out of here and fast because if we just try to sail away Big Mom's gonna catch us so use coup de burst just to get some distance but Paris Barrow is not dumb fucking shit up because he uses candy on the ocean so they cannot move and there's also a really kind of creepy panel where Jimbei just asks Oi Chopper Brooke you guys awake? <laughs> While they're frozen in candy right next Yo, to Yo, dudes. You guys alive? Come on. <laughs> There's a countdown going on and no one knows about it. And it's like, how much of the three minutes have gone? This is starting to get scary. And then the next page. 
yeah, like I said, candy net. So Peril Sparrow still thinks, okay, gotta fuck more shit up for you. And even then they got Big Mom coming on one side and a fleet of ships on the other. So, things not looking good. Don't do oh. me, don't do this to me, Grail. Don't do this. I, we need to talk about the end of this chapter because, holy okay, shit. Yeah. So, finally, Pedro just goes in. Because he wants to make sure that Perospero can't do any of that shit again. But Perospero just smacks him to the ground. So Pedro takes out that dynamite you might remember from earlier. That's strapped all around him. Blows, him sh blows himself the fuck up! What yeah. the fuck happened and this week? We can see We're the gonna... explosion was... I mean, you can see Big Mom and the Mary on the background. So you can compare the size. Like, we're what the, the fuck did he put into those explosives? We're gonna need a lot of anime bandages to heal him up after this. <laughs> <laughs> so much shit happened this week. Like, this was an incredibly dense chapter. Mm. So much yeah. stuff happened, so much to talk about, and then it all ends in... Wait, did wait did Pedro blow himself up? I mean... I think he <laughs> might, may well have done that, this chapter, because... <laughs> Pell survived a nuke. Yeah, that's that's the thing in the back of my head is that I don't buy anyone blowing themselves up in one piece. I'm saying then unless again, there's a literal unless there's a literal fist of fire through your heart, most of the time you're gonna be okay. Unless, or unless just someone stabs you through the heart with a knife. Unless we have an entire chapter dedicated around your death, what you meant to people and everything else around it, you're not dead. Monet I saw she she had that. When they got stabbed in the heart. When they got yeah. stabbed in the heart and had her and entire didn't have the whole chapter machine. going about that. <clears throat> and she, she was had... also in the facility as it exploded. Same with Virgo. She also did blow herself up. She's possibly not dead, you're right. But Well, she like... didn't get a chance to blow herself up. Just the place yeah. collapsed. But yeah. I would say Pedro has a good chance of dying because for one we already knew that he doesn't have a lot of time left with all the time Big Mom took from him. And several times he did seem to imply that he did not intend on returning. Hmm. But you got two days left from retirement, boys. Literally. And <laughs> three days to live, so kind of fucked with that. And four days until my dear newborn daughter is born. Like, oh, <laughs> dude, stop, stop. <laughs> You're not making this better for yourself. It's like... But don't you think it's weird? Like, when he was going to blow himself up the first time, it had a normal build to it, even though he was saved. And in this chapter, you ha you have maybe a couple of panels early on with him just talking to Carrot about about the straw hats. But then it's only the last two pages that even build up to him killing himself. And I hope this is just what he does. Like, he just becomes the Bond clay of just every arc. Like, well, gotta <laughs> blow myself up again. Because it's it feels really weird for Rhoda, and I don't know if if with everything going on, he couldn't fit in the build up for this, or it or he was going for something a bit smaller, and it in the moment it came, it came across he he sort of built it he sort of built it up and escalated it a bit too much in these final two pages, and but it's really up, weird. Yeah, but maybe the build-up wasn't done here so much it was do done throughout the arc, as we saw, like, history Pedro has, how little life he has left, and his willingness to give his life it to the Straw Hats. Oh, true. But, and that, and that, I remember at the time, that build-up worked very well up until the first time he tried to blow himself up. But we haven't had a return of it since, and that was quite a long time ago. Well... At least the answer will not be coming next week because One Piece is on break. Yay! Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so I'm going to need to wait and see about that because it feels weird for One Piece. But the rest of it's a load of really cool stuff in the rest of this chapter. Like, I, I, I went on about how I love like the comparison of Dogtooth directly to Luffy in this chapter and how it's setting up essentially here's, your, here's Luffy's opponent within the Big Mom Pirates to to return on a later date. But yeah. there's also... But the, sorry. You'd really think that opponent would be Big Mom herself. 
Well, he can't fight all of the emperors himself. He, he, he can't, like, pick personal fights with all of the emperors. That would just get a bit repetitive eventually. Well, I guess I'm going to get eliminated some other way. Yeah. But we also have the... It was also a really nice touch in this chapter, which is... And throughout this arc, we've we've only been going with through the arc with half a crew of Straw Hats. And Oda spent a decent amount of time, like, showing why each of them and why each of them are needed by showing the problems that them not being there cause the crew like with the german 66 were introduced because no one on the crew could cook like properly in the, the, the new world environment and in this chapter we get the thing of nami talking to jimbe about okay we need to get the ship to sail how do we do that i'm not entirely sure frankie's not here we've got this thing called coup de burst though we could try that and like they're, they're, they can just about set up the ship, but they can't do it in enough time to actually set up because Frankie's not here. And it was nice to see, like, the by his absence, how much Frankie meant to the crew. Yeah, Oda has that habit of often just taking people out of an arc from the Straw Hats. Like, with the Skypea arc, he just early on took out Usopp and... Well, not Usopp, but Sanji was just fried to show other straw hats getting their spotlight true but that's not but he normally does that when he when he essentially oda has a problem that his cast is a bit too big for him to handle at the moment and normally and beforehand he he definitely did just take out some people in the straw hats but in sky pier they didn't they didn't have a point where because sanji or usopp were down there wasn't a big moment of of oh no we're we're starving or oh no if only we had a sniper at this point but oh no usopp's not here I do mm -hmm. see that this works really well for the arc. Mm. It's, a, it's a nice touch. Yeah. Do you have anything else, or should we move on? We can move on, I think. I don't have much left. All right. I could go on for about an hour on this, so yeah, let's move on. In that case, next up is Shogeki no Soma. <laughs> <laughs> Fun times. Well, why don't you have to do that, because my browser is stuck. Completely. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. So, the night passes. Everyone sleep sleeps, and now they start to get gather. Some are planning. Some are playing cards like Soma, Alice, and Kurokiba, which is amazing. Uh, then, then the rest of Central shows up, including Momo, mentioning that um. Apparently, Sukasa and Rindo are still super, super tired, and <laughs> I can see why. Sukasa's posing on a couch, and Rindo's sleeping in a corner next to her bed. <laughs> <laughs> None of this makes sense. I just... <laughs> oh, God. Um, so, Saito was apparently doing a Japanese refreshing techniques in the cold Hokkaido winter, which is... Pretty fun. Um, they uh, they mentioned that Aldini now has a wacky nickname thanks to Momo, um, and also Kuga possibly. <laughs> uh, but apparently she gives everybody these nicknames, which is very ador <laughs> adorable. Um, it, but it is until you find out why she does it, and she's just like, "Oh, I can see why this person's a villain. I want to see defeated now." Yeah. <laughs> uh, we see that Somei, Momo, and Azon are heading out. Um, we then, and then we see the matchups: uh, Somei versus Soma, which is going to be very confusing. So I'm yep. just going to call him Saito from now on. Um, Takumi versus Azon, which I mean, <laughs> Azon, I love you, dude, but you were the only person who I think. He could, like, believably defeat, so I think you're done for here. Yeah, well, that, I mean, I... only one who we already knew, since we had that eel dude and the new chick that just got off-screen spanked. Yeah. And, and Azon's also the one that's... His skill is not in cooking, but, fi but organizing and finance. He's also the one of the Elite Ten we've seen defeated before. And he's against Takumi. I honestly... It's like, I, I have no yeah. interest in watching this fight. And then, most confusingly of all, we have Momo 
versus Megumi. And I like that even the series itself is like, wait, what the fuck? Really? It, it's, yeah. I, and, and, it, it, and it implies that she asked to for this matchup, which I think is quite interesting. It's, it's odd in the sense that uh, this really doesn't fit in at all to her cooking style, since a lot of it is based around vegetable cuisine. Um, but, and it's also interesting in the sense that, like, she's one of the few characters who we've never seen work with desserts at all. Like, we've seen Takumi work with them. I think we kind of saw Soma work with them one point, but not, like, very in-depth. That said, the ending of this chapter does give a pretty good hint as to why she may have chosen it, because Shinomiya shows up. <laughs> I love when Shinomiya shows up, and he's just like... This makes no sense in the story, but you're a good character, bro. I want to see this. Ha- I want to see what, what where this goes from here. Oh, it's not, awesome! <laughs> not to mention, Shinomiya is a pretty good choice considering that it was him who almost got Megum- Megumi expelled at one point. I love yeah. that, and I love this. I think this is such a uh, sh- though. Though Shokugeki no Soma hasn't done very well in utilizing its whole cast. It does have a very dynamic cast. So whenever you have these very bizarre pairings like this, it always adds a lot of intrigue. And knowing the kind of history that these two characters have, it's gotten me very excited for this. And it's also going to be interesting in the sense that I think this is the first real baking shokugeki we've ever seen apart from... You, you, at least a baking shokugeki where the two chefs aren't making the exact same thing, like Subaru and Aldini. Uh, so this I, is going to be... Did I miss this? Yeah, sorry. Did they actually state that both of them have to be making desserts or baking something? That's no, what I was thinking, yeah. No, I but think... I, have, I have to imagine that that's probably where it's going to go, because it won't be that much of a actual battle if it's like, and you, the top pastry chef in all of Totsuki, your ingredient is ribeye steak. I'm like, fuck! <laughs> I still think that it could yeah. be an ingredient that lends itself to both desserts and whatever Megumi would be making. I have a feeling it's going to go that way as well. Like, because you were saying earlier that having Megumi make pastries makes no sense. Not to mention, like, she would lose. I mean, yeah, she would not lose to badly. shit on her, but this is facing against one of the Council of Ten, the best chefs on their turf. In, in a field that she can't sort of like sidestep into. See, I'd agree with that, but Nene got Soma, and then Saito got Tuna. So it's it's certainly a case where I feel like the pattern we've seen is a lot of the time dramatic convenience is sort of pushing in the Elite Ten's favor a little bit. Um, so it, it very much could be an, agree- an ingredient that could lend itself to both. If I were to give, like, a theory, it might be kind of cool if tomatoes are the secret ingredient. Mm. You know, because, yes, it is technically a fruit, and it can be used in sweet preparations, but more typically it's used in savory. So that would be cool to see. But just from the pattern that we've seen so far... It sort of appeared that things are kind of going in a certain direction with these things. Yeah. I would also quite like the idea of one is desserts, one is vegetables. Fuck it. Um, fuck it. Your secret ingredient is meat. <laughs> <laughs> I do quite like that as an idea. That, that, that tickles me. It's like, here's the, your, both of your worst possible things. And in that situation, I could see Megumi winning, winning because she has the most experience picking herself up from the bottom and getting on with it. Yeah, I'm still gonna just say that this is probably the show I'm most excited to see. Yeah, Even I do not about any that. big shots like, well, maybe Alice finally cooking would be bigger, but not Alice, Airy not. In the cage, yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, if that, again, I've said it this entire time, if there's like a twist at the end where it's like, fuck, we need two sous chefs, and Kuroki would just punches himself <laughs> out of the cave like, me, me, I'm like, oh, that'd be awesome. It's never gonna happen. I've just... I just sort of decided that my two favorite characters are probably not going to do anything else in this series for a very long time. Also, considering that my, I get really annoyed every time they draw that cage and the bars just sort of disappear in front of people's faces. 
it, it's an art style that really, really annoys me. I'm just like, he, you, it's just like, okay, what you need to do is stand a load of people in front of the bars and just walk through the uh, the hole that gets magically <laughs> made in them. Well, would you prefer that their faces are constantly covered by the iron bars? What you need to, what you need to do is maybe like call the Japanese school board and be like, hey. I know these guys are technically expelled. You're still putting kids in cages. Yeah, they're expelled. You have less of a like. It's you don't have a right to put kids in cages. You you now have less of a right to put kids in cages. As I would so probably like just be like, okay then. In that case, since you aren't students, get the fuck out of my arena. This is for students <laughs> only. And they're like, it's the definitely. Cage. And it's like it's definitely not. There's no way that all. There's no way that your entire student body is just watching this match right now. Wait, are they? And they're like, yeah, we really waste our kids' tuition. Yeah, because we've been through this before. They've had these kids, the entire student body, watch this match for two days now. Just not sitting just, there. Not just watch the match. They have to be paying for these kids' ho hotel fees. <laughs> yeah. And presumably all meals. Because it's not like they're just like, all right, you've watched, uh, you've watched what was established last week of possibly being six hour performances of just watching other people cook and smelling their food. There doesn't seem to be any refreshment stands, so I guess, guess once you're done, go hunt a wolf or something? I don't know. <laughs> but, but can you imagine how tired the chefs would be to cook for that many people? Like, they would, they'd have to sleep for weeks. I, oh. Exactly. You gotta pay for the hospital bills of all your other chefs, too, because the moment they cook one dish, they go into a coma for eight days. <laughs> Like, I was listening to Weekly Manga Recap, and they hit the nail on the head, pointing out that this that entire that entire plan assumes that magically only Central gets tired from cooking, and it, it less and less of this plan makes sense at all. And just like plot convenience, we're yeah, planning. I mean, that's free. like I would accept that in a battle manga, but I'm not sure cooking makes you that tired. I mean, it does. Both sides get equally tired. <laughs> I mean, cooking does make you tired after a while, but after a good 24 hours sleep, I feel like you'd be okay. I mean, there are people who do this every single, like, actual chefs cook, yeah. like, 12 hour shifts every single day. <laughs> Making more than three platters of meals. None of these people are going to survive the culinary world. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, I would accept that all the students are there, because this is Zombie. He probably wants to make a big spectacle out of what happens if you try to resist his regime. But, yeah. you make a point that the cost of keeping everyone there... I weep for that Totsuki accountant who has to budget all of this. Like, alright guys, hold on for a moment. So we're renting out an entire arena for two days straight. Uh, Olympic-sized arena, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the hotel next to it. Well, yeah, but we own the hotel. Well, yes, but we're not making any money from this because all <laughs> the students are occupying the room so we can't bring other people in to actually make money from the hotel. Not to yes. mention all the cancellation but fees we have to pay for the people who had reserved it and the bad press because we did not plan to have this regime de cuisine. Yep. And they're also gobbling up resources like electricity, water, food, and we still have to pay all the cleaning staff <laughs> and it's all like... the chefs and stuff like that. And we also have to pay for rooms for the people who were fucking expelled because you just want to <laughs> keep them in a cage. <laughs> okay. Which accountant do you think is the like? Which account? Which, which agency's accountants do you reckon is the worst job? Totsuki or Kaiba Corp? Oh, I, if we to, take oh Kaiba Corp is the worst because to, Totsuki is managing all of this somehow. <laughs> yeah, I don't know and, how Kaiba Corp may. Kaiba Corp at least makes money off of the most lucrative thing in the entire world, <laughs> which is card games. Yeah. Not to mention, I don't think Totsuki has to face constant lawsuits about their attempted murders. <laughs> this is like, do we rent out an entire train line in Hokkaido, or do I buy an entire city and make it look like a dragon? <laughs> they have to. They have to build. Take constant lawsuits about the fact that they're t keeping students in cages, and all for so presumably. Okay, this is an issue I had a lot. 
long time ago, but I feel like it, no matter how many trained professionals are with you, I feel like it's illegal to send a kid into the freezing north to hunt bears. I feel like that has to be. I'm pretty sure when you enter Totsuki, you sign, a, you sign away all of your human rights. All I, of your human rights and all of your buddies' human rights and all of your dogs, <laughs> dog family, rights. Like, friends, anyone who's ever spoken to you. Any money you'll ever gain. Oh, gain ever. <laughs> My god. Yeah, I don't think they sent anyone to hunt bears. I think Soma just left on his own, thinking it was somehow a good idea. <laughs> Maybe he got his hands on the script for Revenant 2. Guy has a really <laughs> bad idea, but he's really committed to it. Uh, do we ever, do we, do we, shall we continue to riff on Shokugeki, Shokugeki for another half an hour, or shall we move on? This was a good chapter. I liked it a lot, but God, the implications of this series make me laugh so much. <laughs> it yeah. is getting to the point. Yeah, no, I'm... I think that's just the thing. When you place your series a little closer to reality, but still keep that fantastical element, you raise so many questions about the logistics of it all. And with the speed we've been going, we've had to skip over a lot of explanations of how the hell does this thing fucking work. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Maybe a zombie just blackmails a shit ton of people. Or gives them food that just makes them go like, this does break every law in the book, but oh god, these meatballs. Yeah, I don't fucking care. Just give me more of these and <laughs> just you can love Switzerland for all I care. He, he just laces all his food with cocaine. And just gets people hooked. <laughs> so that's my cooking style. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> it's water. Ordinary water. Laced with LSD! It's like, a zombie. Yeah, look, I know what you're doing here. This is very illegal to sell to children. But here, have some of my cocaine pie. Sorry, did I say cocaine pie? I meant heroin. <laughs> oh, it's so, oh, it's so good, a zombie. Please go on breaking multiple <laughs> human rights laws. Okay, should we move on, or we will riff another, for another hour? Yeah, let's... Next one is Black Clover. <laughs> okay, so in this chapter, oh god, okay, in this chapter, we essentially have the start of the second round, which is Asta versus, yeah, the, um, wait, I'm, I just want to check, this chapter is the one which is them beating up the Sakura guy, right? Yeah, chapter oh, yeah. one, two, three, the Commodore's yeah. Trap. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so this is this is the start of Asta being the worst protagonist ever and the worst person to ever work with. Jesus. Because he he starts off it annoys me so much that he essentially goes, I destroyed all your traps. Now we have to work together. That's what teamwork's for. I've taught you a lesson. It's just like, no, you've ruined all of our plans and now I have to work with you, otherwise I get kicked out. You are the worst person to work with in a team competition. This is not teamwork, this is blackmail. He is worse than the guy, than the than blackmail dude who was just treating him like a dick for the entire time, because at least that guy had a plan. And then they make up a plan because they are forced to, and actually the guy explains his trap powers, which I'm not entirely sure how this is ash magic, but he essentially has three very standard traps that he can do now. Um, he can chain people down, he can make a pitfall, and I think he can blow shit up. Yeah, why not just make this trap magic? I don't... <laughs> yeah, I'm like, ash ma Okay, cool. How is this ash magic? Maybe... Apart from, like... Yeah, maybe it's just, like, magic has to be of some element, and there really isn't an element between water, fire, wind, and earth that is trap. Yeah. Then yeah. The that, then there's a bit that really annoys me, which is where... Mimosa's brother, weird Sakura guy, finds out that Magna is a commoner, has a complete 180 turn of character where he not only, ref after the last fight when he was helping Magna and Blue Rose Girl fight and work with him really well and showing his ability as a leader, he finds out one of them is a commoner and then just goes, fuck it, I'm not working with any of you, including the one that isn't a commoner and I should be completely fine with, does a 180 degree turn in character and gets beaten because of a flaw that was introduced in this chapter. Also, apparently they just trap him in a hole in the ground and all of his sacro magic just stops him getting out of it. 
because the Magic in Black Clover has no rules and there's no real... There's no scale in it. So I don't know if it was meant to happen. I don't know if any, I don't know if anything's possible to happen in this chap in this series. So when it does happen, it's like, okay, I guess. Because then they end up with everyone working together. It's like, yay, friendship. I actually sort of like that ending, where it's like, okay, this guy has insanely good magic detection ability, so any traps we make, he's just going to see them, so that's not going to work. So instead they just dig a big hole, make sure that, okay, there's no magic in this. You just rely oh, wow. on your magical sight, so you completely overlook this possibility. How do they dig the hole? Yeah, that's the part I don't get. Like, <laughs> when did they have a chance for that? Also, okay. I'm sorry, but what are the, like... Oh no, I fell. It's like, but you can fly. You can fly. Well, that, that is <laughs> just just <laughs> say like, oh, I fell. You I, can turn. I, I, look, I. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he does say like, I'll just fly right out of a primitive la trap like this. But by that point, Asta is over him, blocking the entire pathway with his cleaver and the smaller sword. He is. I just don't. He shouldn't get why fall. it takes him so long. Like, I feel the like moment... the shock is so just like, my god, I've been, like, my god, I've fallen, I've fallen, I've, okay, I can just get up. Now I can't. It's like, I mean, no, this isn't I'm that just... big a deal, dude. <laughs> like, there are monologues being given with him sitting at the bottom of this hole. And it's, like, that's annoying. But the thing that really, really annoys me is the bit where he just has the entire 180 degree turning character so that he can get beaten in this chapter. Yeah, well, you know, Black Clover, they're not really good at doing build-up or anything. Just give the big payoff and cheer the cheers. That's how it works, right? Well, they did give build-up to this character. They didn't just they then decided to go entirely back on it. This infuriates this chapter infuriates me on so many levels because I have seen I saw better write I saw better writing in a teamwork competition in our melee than in a officially published manga. And this is so annoying. There's the fact of just like, I destroyed your trap magic. So we now have to work together. And that, and it's, it's not, the response should be, oh my God, you're, a, why would you do that? Why would that make me want to work with you? You've just ruined our chances and are then blackmailing me into working with you and then acting like I'm the bad guy. Well, but that's kind of what he says. Fuck only, you. only reason. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he does say, like, like, fuck you, you little shrimp. Only reason I'm working with you now is because I actually gotta win. So even though you are shit, I am forced to work with you. But the way the chapter's written and the and the way Ass is portrayed is that, that he's in the right for this. Yeah, and this, but this was is shonen, and Ass to has to be right. But this is bad shonen. This is very, very bad shonen. <laughs> oh, it is. It's very bad shonen. Like, I, I have the problem in that ever since I said I don't want to hate on Black Clover anymore, I've spent two weeks hating on Black Clover. <laughs> and it's just, this is legitimately bad writing. And it's disappointing to see from a published series in Shonen Jump. Oh. You want to read something better? Yes. Yes. Promise Neverland. Eh, no, no, let's move on to, you said something better. <laughs> and guess who called it this guy <laughs> well it was kind was of obvious yeah yeah of course it was I'm just happy yeah. I'm... congratulations Nova yeah I called what's his face drinks air dude was evil uh so uh so, so should I recap this one or does someone else want to or... uh, you can take that I'll take the last one sure so, as we find out, uh, this man is not William Minerva, uh, and William Minerva has not been in here for quite a while. Who he is, is another person who has escaped from the demons, uh, along with another pen. Uh, he, talk he talks about um, how he doesn't really believe that, you know, William Minerva was all... All that great because he never appeared and he seemed like an absolute liar getting a lot of the kids down but he was happy about the shelter it is food electricity space to live information and materials about the world thanks to him 
And he's like, yeah, all my friends are dead. And I may have killed them. I may not have. It may have just been the world. It's kind of hard to say, mm -hmm. but I'm a super survivalist. And I've done that by getting rid of useless things. Uh, which is interesting, because I hope when Weekly Mong Recap covers this chapter, they give him the Ray voice, too. Because <laughs> this really just... This really does seem like the direction Ray's character was going in if he didn't, you know, open up his heart a little bit more. He then takes out a gun as like, hey, um, hand over that pen so you can't get back here and then leave immediately or else I'm going to kill all of you. Yeah. Yeah, that might be a problem considering he only had six bullets in that gun. After that, those kids, they're gonna bite and kick at your ankles, dude. Really bad. You did not I'm think this through. And I'm also gonna go ahead and call this right now. There's no bullets in the that gun. The gun's with no bullets in it, yeah. Yeah, this is purely a boast. I'm gonna... Because I have to think of the psychological way they're gonna get out of this. Because that's normally Promise Neverland style. Yeah. I'm... I take the piss. I'm actually hopeful for how this chapter's going to go because mm -hmm. we've now got a contest of wits between people and an interesting pa and, an, and an interesting parallel to draw from. I can't yeah. see it going on very long because I doubt this guy's going to be an ally. So once and I don't see defeating him taking too long. But I'm interested because it is Promise Neverland does really good battles of wits. Yeah, but I also like the element this guy brings, like, he is the reality that there's limited resources here. These kids will at some point be a burden and probably die, possibly bringing him down too. He's a pragmatist. What he says is dickish, but it's also kind of true. Mm. And all the kids are ideologues to a fault. To the point where I think that's where, the, where, the, where, this com where this story is going, is that they're more idealistic than anyone else in this world because they're bright-eyed children. And I'm waiting for, the, for when they finally meet Minerva, and he's also an idealist, but a tempered idealist. And, they, and that, even, even the guy who's saving them and trying to save people, I imagine the, the conflict with him is that he, he still can't break the promise and throw the world into war just for the sake of a few children's lives. But also what interests me, like, is William Minerva even alive anymore? Considering it's been 13 years this guy's been waiting and has not seen a glimpse of him or any contact. He is becoming a mythic figure. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. Like, we know that there are humans working with the demons besides the moms. Because Crone did tell about that one guy that actually dropped the pen that she had. And also, we don't know where... Considering there is a mom position available only for girls that graduate, I imagine there is a parallel position for the for the boys. Or, which, which is my pocket theory, is that the boys get turned into demons. I pretty much doubt that theory. So do I. I do too now, but it's, it's always in the back of my mind. Of, wouldn't it be cool if... But anyway, this chapter also brings the interest in direction, like, where does this guy go? Because I genuinely cannot tell how they handled this conflict. I think they might end up... I would be interested if either they... The conflict might be that they think they have to kill him, and the resolution they reach from that. Because I imagine they win. I imagine he's not an ally eventually, because he's a, he's essentially Ray to Ray upgraded as he was without the tempering he's received since Norman's death. I'm the more we talk about this, the more I'm actually intrigued to see where this goes, and that, I haven't been able to say that about Promise Neverland for a while. Mm -hmm. So finally, some optimism for this series, maybe. Mm. Honest, yeah. Honestly, yes. It's taken about, what, 10 chapters, 20 chapters? But yes, finally some optimism. All my Christmases have come early! You guys finally like Promised Neverland. 
<laughs> I've been fine with it for a while. I haven't said I haven't said like any of this sucks. I've been okay with it. No, nah, it's just been me being really negative. Yeah, it just feels like when I've listened to episode of Stammer Stream earlier, always felt like you say like I do like this, but which is kind of like saying this isn't bad, but these are all the reasons why it is bad. <laughs> no, the issue that Promise Neverland has had is it's always been good. The problem is it hasn't been great since they've left the farm, and that's I think the only reason that there has been that negativity is just because we knew how good it could be. And it just wasn't being as excellent as it was before, which meant that everything appeared as a disappointment. Which, again, I don't think Promise Neverland has ever been bad, and I don't think it's anything below. I don't think it's ever been anything below good. I just think now that we're getting back into what the series was at first, which is hopefully more psychological battles. Mm. It should keep going. I mean, if this ends with Ray being like. No, super bow and arrow attack, and like getting him in the eye, and like, ah, oh! <laughs> gray. And I'm like, ah, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> I, I, I do honestly think that it, with after they left Gray, Gray um, Gracefield House, it, it wasn't good. It was bad, but it looks like it's picking up again. Well, if that was the short and sweet of it, let's move on to our final manga. My Hero Academia. Yay! And it's chapter 151. Gotta catch them all. <laughs> no, not seriously. It's Mirio Togata. So we start with, from last time, as... I can't remember his... Did he have a real name? I'll just call him Overhaul. Going like, Each and every one of your actions kills people. Yours is a cursed existence. No, wait, that was second page, yeah. He's just a, telling Aerie to come back so people don't have to be killed because of her. And it's like, you were born to destroy people. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> that guy... Manipulation. Yeah. I didn't think Overhaul was really that great a villain considering he had to go against people like Shigaraki, Stain, and All for One. But... This chapter may have flipped my opinion a bit. Just by how brutal he is. Yeah, I mean... <sighs> God damn. I, the, the, these are the kind of chapters that... Just because the person I am and what I, I do for a living, it really pulls at my heart. Heartstrings a lot. Mirio is amazing in this chapter. Overhaul is an awesome villain. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe... Recap it through the end before going on too much filleting it. All right, so basically... But, yeah. Also, yeah. next we learn that, as Miri asks, how can you say that to your own child? So Overhaul says, huh? Oh, you're worried about that. I have no child. I, I have yeah. no son. I mean daughter. Yeah, I mean, I mean until now, I believe person. that she was his daughter, kind of, since I always thought that Overhaul was a lot younger than that but anyway we now learned that yeah no familial connection uh. and then he breaks the ground beneath them because he reveals his quirk is alchemy from full metal alchemist pretty much it's yeah, great that's what i've been thinking since the beginning just no one ever brought up on that comparison since they talked about one hand creates one hand rebuild it destroys he's scar well yeah, closest to Scar. But yeah, no, now yeah. he starts going at Mirio hard, just ramming him with spikes from rebuilding the ground that he destroyed. And Mirio just has to hold Eri out of it while phasing himself through it all. Because that is kind of a bad situation since Overhaul does not care about hurting the Eri. Because as he puts it, long as does he does it immediately, he can just repair, repair her. Doesn't care if he hits her, no matter how much it hurts her. And as he says, she's experienced it firsthand. Implying it, he has done this. Oh, he's so much of a shit. It's so great. Yeah, and just Mirio's reaction on the next panel. He's like, oh, you motherfucker, I am going to run you through a wood chipper for this. 
that's basically my face. It's just like, oh my god, I hope this guy gets the Theon Greyjoy treatment. But yeah, they've now sealed the exit, so he can't get out. I mean, he could, but he couldn't get Aerie out. And as long as he has to protect Aerie, he's at a great disadvantage. Mm -hmm. But even so, he manages to fight them off, even at one point discarding his cape, just leaving Aerie on it, as the one guy thinks, you're just covering yourself in your cape to make it harder to aim. I thought you just wore those for show. Shows me. I love they that. Have. But then Mirio comes out of the ground and punches the fuck out of that dude. Wait, it's does he great. punch? I can't actually tell if it connects or if Overhaul gets him out of the way in time. He punches. Oh. He punches Overhaul. No, it's not. Yeah, after that, but before that, the other dude. But yeah, like, Overhaul tries to place hand in the way, nope, permeate through, and then solidify to punch the fuck out of Overhaul. Because, like he says, he just left his cape behind. A hero's cape is for bundling up a young girl who's in terrible pain. Mirio is so awesome in this chapter. Mm -hmm. And even when that dude goes for his gun again... Mirio just kicks the fuck out of him by seemingly putting his leg in the ground and just powering on like a, on rocket skates with that power. And then he goes that overhaul again. I'm not sure what he does in this panel, but it's badass that he finally gets such a beating on overhaul. After showing what a shit he is. But... Then we also see a few flashbacks. Firstly about Overhaul. Who, though it seems like he might be somehow troubled because his face is in the shadow. So maybe something's behind that Plague Doctor mask. I think we've seen his mouth though, haven't we? I don't think so. Didn't he have it off in the meeting with... Chir yeah, you, you might be right. I might be, I might I be mis remember misremembering. Properly. But yeah, we, di we see him talking to the former boss who still displays ideals, and at this point too, Overhaul had some mask, but it's not the same one. So, not sure what to deal with that is. But yeah, we show that their ideals clashed. But then, to the end, the drunk guy seemingly isn't down. He begins coming back to the battle. It's, not, it's not the drunk guy, it's the It's, it's the, the truth one. guy. Oh. Yeah, sorry, my mistake. But anyway, he is not there. And we show that why he's loyal to Overhaul. Because he, he got him to tell the truth, like he says, Become my comrade. Having you with me would be very reassuring. Yeah, and it, it, it... Yeah. Then the chapter ends with Overhaul tossing him rounds for that gun with what I assume to be the anti-quirk drug. And oh, he yeah! Shout, fire! And so the bullet is fired, is what it says to the end. As Aerie watches from the sideline. That What's gonna a... happen to them?! I wanna know! That makes know! a lot of sense, because I originally thought he just threw him new bullets because he was out of bullets. It's like, okay, can't he phase through them? But no, that makes sense. Well, I mean, he can phase through them, but this might be just taking him by surprise. Yeah. He still has or... to see the blow coming. Or there'll be something about these bullets that it affects quirks, even if quirks are acting upon them. I'm not sure gonna... how that would really work, but... Because we uh... earlier saw him per permeate through one of the bullets, so... I think there's a new bullet. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Also, the answer could just be because magic. Because quirks. Yeah, but, we'll see yeah. next week, but yeah. this is a really good chapter. Oh, yeah. Just see yeah. the depravity of Overhaul and the heroism of Mirio. Yeah, no, it's a... Re I do like this chapter. Like, I've said before, I'm not a fan of Mirio. Like, compared to... And only compared to the rest of the My Hero cast, I've always found him a bit 
underwhelming. But in this chapter, he's really, really good. Essentially because he stepped up to the mark and taken up a position as a hero rather than a sort of like, I'm a right, I'm a sort of, I'm a pseudo, right? I'm an ideological rival to Deku. Look at me be great. And in this chapter, he does shit. And, it's, and it is great. Yeah. And this is finally when Overhaul just goes to the, oh god, please kill him. I mean, we knew that he was experimenting on Eri. We saw the bandage marks. Knew that he was probably drawing blood from her against her will. But now he's like, oh yeah, I've taken her apart before. She's experienced how much that hurts. I'm gonna do it again if I got it, because I don't care if I hit her. Hmm. I am in... It is a good chapter. Mm -hmm. So so we're not entirely fellating it. Um, it does have the problem I have with a lot of my hero chapters, in that they spend ages beating, building up a load of villains, so they're really interesting. But then they have one hero take on three at once... It's a weird power dynamic that you normally see the reverse of in series, which is where you you, you essentially have the underdog protagonist versus multi, versus an overwhelming number of villains. Well, uh, or, or or the underdog or the or the heroes having to team up more. Sorry, I meant the heroes having to team up to take down one incredibly powerful villain. And in this case, you've got the reverse happening, and it works in this chapter, but it always feels a bit weird. It's like, I thought the villains were built up more than this, but apparently Mirio can take out, take on three at once. I think that's a problem in this arc alone, since we had Sun Eater do the same thing earlier. Like, mm. I'd not mind if it was just Mirio, because he was established to be basically the one closest to just being a pro hero level. And we've seen the kind of crazy shit they can do. I mean, Aizawa took on how many dozen heroes on his first real superhero outing? I mean, how many villains? Well, um, he, he took out the entire USJ invasion force, and that was really cool. But I liked that even in that moment, he mm -hmm. couldn't beat them all. He was literally holding them off one after another, and they were inexperienced villains. It, it took All Might to turn up to beat them all. So it's interesting. It's, 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 it's It has become more apparent in this arc, but I think it's... Well, I would say... In defense of this, I think most of the people he's fighting right now are non-combat characters. Like, we didn't really see much to believe that Truth Teller guy had much combat experience. Uh, similarly, with uh, the drunken guy, like, for all we know, they're really just, just there to, like, disorient, him, disorient people and then it's an easy defeat. With the assistant, we know he's a good shot, but there's not much else there. And though mm. Overhaul has a really, really powerful quirk, this is the first time we've ever actually seen him fight. And what, wh while he's pretty decent, Mirio's quirk just kind of... It's not the best matchup for him. It's... Yeah. It's, it depends how this goes. I, I'm, especially with how this chapter ends, I imagine Mirio gets defeated. But it did feel a bit weird... It did feel a bit weird that even with the quirk, like the conflict in quirks with Miro having the advantage, he was still wailing on Overhaul, even when having to contend with two or two or three of his other minions around him. So if this was just him fighting Overhaul and it just turns out the quirks worked in Mirio's favour, like I could then see him beating up um, Overhaul as much as he does in this chapter. But he's even if they're not combat figures, they are things he has to he has to look out for one bullet in the wrong situation can, can still kill him. And he's taking down two or th um, three or um, I think it's three of them at once and wailing on them. And he, I like we said, he's nearly a pro hero, but he's not a pro hero. This guy is still a student. But they point out like he's one of the best students and on a level of a pro hero. But if I all pro heroes were this powerful, it again begs the question of why, like, what's the threat of the villains if any pro hero can take down even the the biggest bad in, in an organization and a couple of his mooks at the same time? Well, they did say that that's why crime syndicates don't really exist anymore. I actually gotta head out right now. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I yeah. think we're about done here anyway. That was the last yeah. one, and I think we've said enough on that. So... Mm -hmm. 
I guess I should list all of the, that stuff that comes at the end, so... Follow me on at Nuclear Android for all that random crap that I say in there. Follow... Jonah, what was your Twitter name again? Uh, Jonah Lev Snow, I think. Okay, follow at Jonah Lev Snow for whatever he does. And follow... There is no point following me. I do not use Twitter. Okay, do not follow him. And we're really oh doing all that random shit. Yeah. And of ODAR course... ODAR is great. Yeah. You have to sign up at odar.conforums.com because that is, without a doubt, the greatest site in all of existence. You will see the face of God when you first tr say, gaze upon it. Note to self, upload face of God. Note to self, <laughs> create face of God. Because... Note to self, create God. Hang on, no, no, we're getting into the, we're getting into cat territory here. Let's let's stop now. Yeah, Note I to think self. we do Main not. Name Panic at the Disco song after a similar concept. <laughs> Note to self, cut the recording right now.